Our first speaker today, he is a well-known uh, educator, consultant in the space. Uh, some say he's a, a Toxie Maxi. He is, uh, he's, he's been uh, listed on the shirt. You know, there's an infamous shirt going around now with three names. He's one of those names. So everyone, please welcome Giacomo Zucco. Good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, you can see. It. Thank you. You know, this this T-shirt is uh, it's called Nick Carter. is a singer. Uh, it's, it's good. Uh, you know, blonde hair. And um, so I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm happy to be back and honored to be opening. So I, I wanted to to basically pay a tribute to Hodl Hodl. They are running an, an, an exchange where you can buy Bitcoin without KYC trap, so you can uh, keep your privacy. But that's of course is hard because you have to manage your relationship with regulators and other kind of mafia guys. So basically you have a lot of problems for uh, no KYC. So I wanted to smooth things out for them and to give a speech which is a, a speech of uh, appeasement with regulation, a speech which is a little bit, you know, relaxing, mainstream, without too many controversy. So I choose uh, this title. Uh, and it's... Uh... <laughs> but then, the, the reason why the title was not announced is that I, I still had to take a, a flight here, so it was better not to have it on the website. But then I, I realized it was probably too much. So I decided to pull a John Carvalho and make it a sweeter, like, good morning. Money Landrick is beautiful. So uh, let's start from, from a little bit from afar from, from Money Landrick uh, beauty, beauty. And uh, let's start from the point that uh, speech must be free. And try, let me elaborate that for, uh, for, uh, for a few minutes. Uh, the first point to elaborate is that speech is a fundamental right. I, I assume you already agree. If you don't, uh, it's okay to be wrong, you just meet me uh, later and I will explain, but let's just go over a very quick uh, list of the reasons that uh, uh, speech, free speech is a fundamental right. There are deontological reasons. It's, oh, wait, oh, they are censoring me already. Uh, <laughs> that was fast. So there are deontological, which is a word that is very like, uh, like uh, pretentious, but it just means that there are logical reasons uh, before e experience or before any kind of utilitarian logic that explain why speech should be free. Uh, the, the framework I like more for, uh, for uh, deontology uh, is uh, called argumentation ethics. Uh, this guy here is uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, he's a nice guy, if you know him. And uh, I, I suggest you to read Argumentation Ethics. It's a fundamental, uh, it's my favorite framework for uh, ethical points. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, if you follow this, uh, this uh, ethical framework, uh, you don't only learn that uh, speech must be free, but also that speech is the foundation on the reason everything else must be free as well and every other interaction must be voluntary. So there are ethical, fundamental, first principle reasons why speech must be free, but also practical reasons like utilitarian reasons, like a society is better if a speech is free. This guy here is uh, John Stuart Mill. He's, he's quite ugly, actually. I, I've read a lot of him, but never, never really looked at the picture. It's well, impressive. But anyway, he's, he's, he's right on, I don't love the philosopher, but he's right on some things. One of the things is that society is better if people is free to speak up and to transmit information freely. Uh, of course, free speech doesn't mean that you are forced to give your platform, your private property to somebody else. If you run a journal, your, uh, other people is not entitled to your first page. So it doesn't mean that you owe somebody else uh, a stage, for example. So moderation in a forum is not censorship. But there are, uh, so uh, at the fundamental uh, deontological point uh, is that uh, at least you should not uh, aggress other people for speaking up. But there is an utilitarian point uh, for which society is better if everybody is not just allowed, but even facilitated in speaking out when they disagree. Why? Because so you can have more competition of ideas, you can find mistakes, you can basically debug society because there are more tests. Even if, something say, if somebody says something wrong, it's nice to, that you can hear it because you can at least say why it's wrong and you can basically 
create immunity, uh, herd immunity, natural herd immunity for, uh, for bad ideas. So there, these are the reasons why speech must be free. Of course, uh, uh, there are some exceptions that are not actually speech. Uh, so for example, if you uh, are ordering an aggression, if I have like a voice commanded gun and I order the, the gun to kill Stefan, that's not speech, that's aggression. And the same if I have a military and I am like a head of state and I order my military to invite, invade the country, that's not speech. That's actually violence used through other human beings as a mean, as an instrument. So uh, that's not speech. That should not be free or protected. That should be fight, uh, fought, and should be basically uh, kept in check. The second uh, exception is uh, intentional fraud. If I tell you that I'm providing a service to you and then I don't, that's not just a different opinion, that's fraud. I'm basically robbing you. I'm breaking my contract with you. So that's also a problem which is not covered by free speech. But it's important to distinguish that uh, bad opinions are not aggressions. Like actual aggressions are aggressions that could be also ordered by voice, but bad opinions, no matter how bad, they are not aggression, they are not an exception, and the generic lies are not breaches of contract. So you can lie, uh, it's not nice, you shouldn't, but I shouldn't punch you if you do. And you should be allowed to have bad opinions, and I should debunk them with reason and not with violence. So we all agree on this, right? Uh, of course there is a problem, which is censorship. So during the, the course of history, every kind of tyrant tried to stop uh, a speech that they didn't agree with. This happened in the ancient times. So this guy, Philip IV of France, he didn't like free speech. He, uh, this guy, Napoleon, he didn't like free speech. But even more recently, this guy, Adolf, he didn't like free speech. This guy, Joseph, he didn't like free speech. Even more recently, like this guy, Mao, didn't like free speech. This guy, Fidel, didn't like free speech. And even now, there, there are still people are alive now. Like, for example, this guy, Kim, doesn't, and this guy, Justin, doesn't. Um, <laughs> well, Sorry, okay. I know, I know why you're lighting. This, it's unfair on my side to use uh, Justin here. Uh, it's, it's a little bit too much. It's not fair because there is already another member of the Castro family. So it, it looks like an, like an overkill. Like, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, so uh, tyrants all, always fought speech. But there are new things that are happening now, now, right now that are a little bit unprecedented in history. Well, not completely, but, but they are kind of new and we have, to, we have to analyze them better to fight them. One is basically the fact that private companies are becoming very important in censoring speech as well. So maybe you don't have, the, uh, you don't have cops coming to your home to arrest you because you protested against the government. Actually, you do, like in Australia. But uh, e even if you don't, maybe you have a Facebook which was visited by the FBI before that is basically censoring you on the private platform. This is, this is kind of strange because what I said before is that you don't have the obligation to give a platform to somebody with your private property. So you can say it's their right to just decide arbitrary moderation rules. So it's, it's for us, for people that are free speech advocates, the fact that private people are deciding apparently privately to allow or not allow some speech can be messy to, uh, to judge. I see a lot of libertarians that are, that are basically uh, cheering for government controlling social networks, which is not a good thing, even if you want to do that in order to avoid censorship. So it's complicated. And the other very complicated thing is that uh, anonymous speech, I, I hope you can read it, but anonymous speech is the new boogeyman. So traditionally to, uh, throughout history, uh, tyrants were attacking speech against them. Now they're starting not just to attack wrong speech or wrong think, uh, like Orwell said, they're also attacking any kind of speech where they cannot attach a name to. So even if you're not saying anything controversial, they're trying to prevent you to buy an anonymous SIM, to say something, uh, even something good, even praising the government, but you should do that with your name attached on the SIM. They are trying to do the same. There, there are proposals to basically tie internet connection to your physical identity. Why? Because uh, no matter what you say, if I know who you are and where you live, if you do wrong talk, I can come to hurt you. If I don't know who you are, if you have anonymity, then I cannot hurt you. And it's not, a chance that, it's not by chance that many 
important political documents like a Federalist paper in the United States, they were uh, pseudonymous. M many uh, pieces of art and politics were pseudonymous because sometimes people just want to face uh, the, the crowd and just, just, they want to be brave and, and martyrs. Sometimes people want to be tactic and they want to basically survive and keep spreading ideas and so they need uh, anonymity. So right now there is an attack not just on wrong opinion, on bad opinion, or what they consider bad opinions, but also on any kind of opinion where, it's not your name, uh, uh, where your name is not attached to them, which is bad and a problem. So, uh, what are the solutions to this? Well, the first solution is just outgunning the sensor. So, uh, if you have uh, enough guns, uh, you, will just, uh, uh, you will just fight the sensor and win. It can happen in history. It's not easy, but it can happen. Or you can just do jurisdictional arbitrage. So you move around, so for example, this flag is the American flag. Uh, it was the result of the first solution. So these guys were oppressed, so they just took guns and they fought and they won and they created the United States. Then they fucked up. But uh, on a few things, they didn't fuck up that much. For example, uh, free speech, if you look at many classification, uh, it's still pretty good in the United States. You can probably say whatever you want without serious consequences. So if you want free speech, you should move to the United States Unless, unless your speech concerns uh, uh, American soldiers killing people, then you should uh, probably not move to the United States. So it's not universal as a solution. It depends. If you want to speak about anything else which is not the uh, United States military killing people, you move to the United States. Uh, the, the other solution is uh, Agorist tools. What is agorism? Agorism is a, is a current of libertarianism that say, let's, let's not just uh, claim that freedom is good. Let's build tools that can increase freedom and can basically empower us in the fight for freedom. Uh, agorism is very close to, uh, to cypherpunk ideals and to crypto anarchist ideals that are basically the, the cultural ground of Bitcoin. So you should recognize it. So if you use a Tor uh, network over the internet, you, you can be censored, but it's harder to censor you. They really have to spend money and time to really then remind you and find you and then to give you two life sentences for a website. But they need a lot of effort to do that. So these are the, the possible solutions. Let's move from free speech to free money, not, not in that sense, in the other sense, not as in beer. Uh, so money must be free as well. It must be expensive to create, but free to move and trade and share and pay and uh, transfer. Why? Uh, well, let's, let's uh, just analyze the, the reason. My claim is that transferring money is a fundamental right just like speech. It's just the same. It's not just the same in general. It's coming from the same sources because basically uh, property is kind of speech and I will try to address this point. I know it's a little bit, uh, it's a, bit a stretch. And uh, money is property, so money is speech. Why do I say that property is speech? Well, this guy is, uh, is John Locke. He's also ugly. I mean, what did they eat at that time? I mean, it's, uh, they really don't look healthy. But anyway, it was, it was probably cooler than, 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 than Milton and the mill. And um, he, he basically said that there are two ways to acquire property justly. Uh, one is homestead. So you mix your labor with, uh, with a field. You, you work on unappropriated resources and you appropriate them. You, typical homestead principle. And the second one is contract. So you just give your resources away. You promise somebody else not to exercise your appropriation control in exchange for something maybe or as a donation. So these are the two ways you appropriate. The first way is not really speech, right? Because if you want to, to like uh, work on a, f on, on a crop field, or sorry, sorry carnivores, if you want to work on cows, for example, you need to actually uh, do something physical. It's not speech, but uh, in order for other people to recognize your private property, you need uh, for them to be able to understand that's an appropriate resource. So many times you, you put fences, you put uh, like a science, you, you have to prove that you mix your labor with uh, an appropriate resource. So you have to give a proof of work. So basically, proof of work. And proof of work is speech. Even if your appropriation is a physical act, uh, your proof that you appropriated is you have to be, let's say, even in Bitcoin, you have to be able to publish a proof that you actually 
did some physical work. So speech is important. If you cannot speak, if you cannot write uh, private property, you cannot communicate that you own something. And of course, trivially, contracts are promises, and promises are, are basically a speech, like a signed transaction. You need basically to, uh, to be able to, to, to uh, give somebody else a, a, an attestate that will forever prove uh, no repute, uh, in a no reputable way that you gave away that property. So it's just like a signed transaction, it's also speech. Uh, so it's, it's all about speech, basically. There is some physical part involved, but mostly property requires speech. There is also another point that I uh, don't have the time to make. Uh, there is a third way that John Locke thinks that you can acquire just property, which is punishment. Uh, uh, because uh, it's, which is also speech, because uh, if I take your stuff, uh, in taking your stuff, I am basically implicitly claiming that I don't support the property rights, so you can take your stuff back, or even more. And I wanted to make a comparison with Latin natural punishment, but it was too much, so I said, well, let's not. So, okay, uh, property is speech, kind of. Uh, money is property, just a, a kind of property which is uh, exchanged for, it's the most saleable property that you can basically exchange for everything else to solve the double coincidence of wants and the store of value problems, blah, blah, blah. So money is basically uh, speech. But money is even more speech than other uh, kind of property. Because money evolved to become, um, during history, more and more information and less and less physical object. The process started with commodity money, like uh, gold nuggets, Gold nuggets is not speech. Uh, the fact that I give you gold nuggets is speech, but the gold nuggets is just a, a physical object. But then they started to, to do coinage, printing the information about the weight, uh, official weight uh, on the coin, and now the, some people were not even accepting the coin for the content value, physical value, but for the nominal value of the information on it. So information started to become more important than the physical support. And this went on with custody, where you just give your uh, gold coin to a bank, and the bank will give you a piece of paper. The piece of paper is not gold, it's just information, just virtual money. It's information that will be redeemable for actual gold. But maybe not, because maybe there is fractional reserve, and so your, your information doesn't even match the, the physical reserves. So money became more and more virtual over time. And then you had fiat money where your piece of paper doesn't even redeem anything at all. So basically your piece of paper will just redeem another piece of paper temporarily because uh, the conversion is suspended in 1971 uh, and it still is. And then there is even worse, uh, digital fiat money. So in, in, a, in a, like physical fiat cash, this, does, this information on paper doesn't convert to anything physical, just other information. But at least there is a physical support that you can trade around, a bearer instrument, a physical token, a physical bearer instrument that you can exchange so you have good privacy, you have some censorship resistance. With the digital fiat, you don't even have that. There is nothing physical anymore. Like in the, the current dollar monetary mass, there is nothing physical, basically. It's residual. Most of stuff is just information. So money is speech. Transferring money right now is just speaking with somebody, just speaking with the public about an intention, about a promise, and nothing more. Um, so you have a, a fundamental right, but you still have exceptions, of course. For example, paying for aggression is not speech. It's just like using speech to, uh, to, to basically trigger a voice command gun, so it's not speech, that's aggression. And uh, intentional fraud with money, so double spending, so I give you money and then I take it back. That's not speech, that's basically fraud. Uh, but again, just like bad opinions are not aggression, uh, bad purchases are not aggressions, and just like not all lies are fraud, not all kind of scams are fraud. So when we say scammer to people like she corners, we don't mean that you should go to jail, you shouldn't, not all. And uh, so now you have uh, notable exceptions and you still have problems. The same problems of before, so these people are still not uh, allowing you to do the same, the, the purchases you want if you are wrong paying. Uh, they will try to stop you, to censor you. Again, apologize for the, to the Castro family, I didn't intend it. And, uh, and we still have this other problem of uh, 
private company censoring money. So, for example, when you have uh, American soldiers killing civilians and laughing, and you have Julian Assange doing journalists and so basically publishing that news, uh, now, uh, the, now you have the government imprisoning him and torturing him and uh, trying to kidnap him and to kill him. So now you have government censorship. But before, you didn't. You just have Visa and MasterCard uh, spontaneously or, 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 or with some push just uh, using their property rights to deny WikiLeaks uh, from receiving any kind of, of uh, financial support. So there is this kind of mixed problem as well. It's not easy to defend from censorship where censorship is mixed with the private moderation because you may not have the right to compel Facebook to publish whatever you want. It's a, uh, just build your own Facebook will be the obvious response, which has some merit. So uh, you have this problem. And the second problem is money laundry laws. Money laundry laws started in the 70s, and they started to switch the mentality again of censorship. It's not just about uh, you cannot do this payment, but you cannot do any payment, even if harmless, in my opinion, if you don't attach your history and identity and reasons and traceability. So the idea basically is switching from uh, uh, presumption of, uh, of innocence to presumption of, of guilt. So it's not that if you pay this thing, you are a criminal, which is already very questionable. If you pay anything and I don't know why and when and from where and who, then you are a criminal as a base layer, as a, as a, as a first assumption. You have to prove your innocence by giving me any information about any unrelated question. So it's a, it's a huge switch in censorship because it's not about punishing some sort of payment, it's about punishing every payment where you don't give up your privacy completely. And they, of course, the money laundry laws, uh, they are recent, just like fiat money. People like, people like us uh, that are born after the 70s, we may think that uh, like fiat money was always there, but it was very uh, recent reckless experiment. And the same for money laundry, anti-money laundry, KYC bullshit is very recent. It's also a, a typical example of economical illiteracy because uh, take, for example, know your customer. Uh, know your customer laws mean that uh, you don't understand economics. The whole point for money is that you don't have to know your customer. The customer has to know the, the, the business because they have to trust the good and the service. So you go to, you go to a shop, you have to trust that the shop is not uh, defrauding you. But the shop, in order to scale, he has to accept cash because it doesn't have to know personally every customer. So the whole point of money is not to know your customer. Otherwise, just use credit, just use an exchange of favor. If you know your customer, you just exchange favor with him. So the point of money is not knowing your customer. Um, so we are at this point, uh, solutions. The first uh, solution is, of course, uh, outgunning the sensor. And now I took a more modern version of, uh, of the Canon. Uh, of course, uh, uh, next year, I will uh, come here to Riga and I will entitle my speech uh, uh, printing guns is beautiful in order to make everybody comfortable and uh, but, but yeah uh, uh, probably guns are not the, the best example because like the, the president of, of, the, of the United States just say that uh, uh, he, if you try to use guns against overreach the government they will use uh, F-15 uh, uh, fighters to bomb you so you need uh, so the president the president Biden said you don't need guns you need F-15 and I think that's acceptable. Uh, so let's print F-15, it's more complex, but we will get there. But until we are there, so printing F-15 is, is a little bit, it's a slow process. So we can try jurisdictional arbitrage. All these countries like Isle of Man, the Switzerland even, uh, or Dubai or whatever, they used to be places where you can go and your payment will not be censored, uh, or mostly not be censored. Uh, this is actually, almost over, like, uh, like 20 years ago, you went to this place and you can do whatever. Now, some of, this, uh, some of them are, are, are keeping up a little bit, uh, like, like uh, Emirates uh, are still good, uh, Switzerland is basically censored as the rest of Europe, almost, at least for non-citizens. And so it's, it's actually deteriorating, because the problem with, uh, with jurisdiction arbitrage is that there is, not, uh, there is a fixed amount of nation states and uh, you cannot create a new one, so they can just make a cartel and they just uh, eliminate any competition and they, just can, they can just make life worse for everybody. So we just remain with the last option, which is agorist tool building. So we should bu build tools to enable censorship resistant payment. Unfortunately, I didn't find an image for this. I don't know what to put there, so it's uh, joking, of course. Um, so 
this is the, the speech, and it can be basically, uh, it can be basically summarized. Incredible, I finished in time, right? This, I, am I in time? It's this, this, is, this is unprecedented. So, um, uh, this, uh, this sentence is, is very nice, it's very famous. Uh, I, this, this, this guy is Voltaire, and he's a little bit less ugly, if you think so. Good, good job, Voltaire. Uh, I disapprove of what you say, but will defend to the death your right to say it. I know, I know, actually, is not really an original quote by Voltaire. It is Evelyn Beatrice Hall, so it's uh, apocryphal, I know, but I don't care. Uh, the, the main point I want to make with this, uh, with this slide is that money is speech. So, the, so we, we, we can keep this motto, we just have to slightly change it and update it uh, with two letters. I disapprove of what you pay, but will defend to the death your right to pay it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo, for an excellent talk. That was excellent. Really enjoyed that.